Reading with your kids. Hola, Niho, Kunichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Mahaba, Mori Maliwanji, Namaste, Jambo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jadley, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so honored that you are joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find your podcast. We have two great guests for you today. A little bit later on, Tane Raphael will be here to celebrate Rhyme Time Twins. But first, our guest is returning to the show, Dr. Peter Solomon. He is here to celebrate the race to the Big Bang. Before we invite Dr. Peter into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by The Adventures of Harry and Friends, the wonderful picture book series by Sarah Tucker. Hey, is your child afraid of the dark? Are they scared of the monsters under their bed? Would you like a really wonderful picture book that can help you help your child put away their fears? I'm Not Afraid has helped thousands of parents teach their kids to face their fears. I'm Not Afraid is one of the seven books in the Adventures of Harry and Friends series by Sarah Tucker. This is a wonderful series that will inspire your kids' imaginations, prepare them for real life challenges, and is really entertaining for kids ages 4 to 8. Please go to Adventures of Harry and Friends. Join us right now from beautiful West Hartford in the state of Connecticut. Our guest is returning to the podcast to celebrate a great new book. It's called The Race to the Big Bang. Please welcome back to the show, Dr. Peter Solomon. Hey, Dr. Peter, how are you? I am very good. And you? I'm wonderful. Uh, things are are starting to open up again. Uh, we're, we're hopefully shedding this pandemic Uh and I just can't wait because I've been here in the studio for two years, and as lovely as it is, I'm done. And I'm ready to get out <laughs> of the world. I hear you. <laughs> so um, tell us about the race to the Big Bang. Well, um, first of all, it is a uh, – the genre is uh, science fact-based fiction where the fiction is uh, time and space travel adventures. But within those adventures, except for the the uh, kids traveling all over the place, the science is, is accurate. And um, the book is a sequel to my first book, uh, which we talked about a year and a half ago or so, uh, called The Stardust Mystery. And it, um, it is a contest. Both of the books are about a contest, um, that is run by a giant aerospace company, uh, to get kids engaged in science. Um, and it is for kids in middle school, uh, maybe, uh, first year of high school, and they form teams. And they, they go on adventures and they have to solve mysteries, solve puzzles and, uh, find things. Uh, so that is, that is the nature of the book. This is really cool. What a great way to introduce kids to the, 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 the science that, that caused this beautiful planet to come to, into being. Right. And there's some other science there. There's some unintended consequences. Uh-huh. Always. And <laughs> when they go back to the planet, they find the planet is inhabited by huge insects. <laughs> so what's happened when they brought the seeds to plant the trees and everything to make this wonderful environment, the seeds had some insects in them. Uh-huh. And because... Insects on Earth actually got huge 
at some point in the past when the oxygen concentration was high and they didn't have a lot of predators. They got huge. Well, now the predators, the bird predators came out and that keeps the insects under control. Well, on the new planet, there were no birds. Ah. <laughs> and so the insects got huge and started attacking their uh, their headquarters building that they they created. And they would get to relate this story of the unintended consequences, a wonderful example of survival of the fittest of the theory of evolution. Wow. So, wow. It, that's like like two or three years of science all yes. rolled into a novel. And And the idea is to give the kids a novel that is fun to read and enjoyable to read. And as they read it, they're picking up some incredible – amounts of of science facts that and not just facts but science stories mm -hmm. so it all wove it into a story yeah. so, it's, it's really fascinating and i think you know we've talked here in the podcast a lot about how human beings have learned learned for centuries through story and then at some point, oh, yeah. and at some point, somebody came along and said, um, "This isn't working the right way. Let's put everybody in a row and make them memorize all this, the, all this stuff." Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and that is, you know, I, I my career was as a scientist, mm -hmm. and uh, that was my objection. I would tutor grandkids in science, and my objection was just the way especially for middle schoolers, the way they taught it. Uh, they try to teach it the same way they teach it in graduate school, except dumb it down a bit. Mm -hmm. But you, what you want to do is teach it through the story. Yeah. And there are so many amazing science stories out there. We've talked about yeah. some of them here. Uh, you know, just going back to the pandemic and, and, and vaccines, we've, we've talked about the story of, of Dr. Jonas Salk. And, you know, what a beautiful story that was. And um, so, yeah, I, I love the fact that you're bringing all this science and wrapping it up in a, in a really exciting, a thrilling kind of uh, story for kids. Okay, so now the subject of our uh, podcast uh -huh. is how, what is, what is the teachable moment? We had this horrible, awful, terrible um, pandemic, and there's a teachable moment in this pandemic. Thank there's goodness. some incredible things that we can learn. Um, and what, what, uh, at the end of the book, there are two, um, epilogues. The kids, um, I won't tell you whether they win or not, but at the end of the contest, the, the kids say, you know, that this whole idea of the pandemic is just like driving their lives uh, crazy. And the kids come up with this idea, you know, you, the, the company has this virtual world where you could go anywhere at any size and any time. And they go to the, the president of the company that sponsored the contest, who, who owns the work virtual world software. And they said, you know, this pandemic has been terrible for us kids, but we would love to do something to make, to, to bring something positive out of the pandemic. And that is, can we use the virtual world to teach some, the kids something about uh, how our bodies work, how the virus works, and how the vaccine works to protect us. So the kids ask uh, Dr. Q, who runs the company, can we use the virtual world uh, and make some movies to teach kids about the infection and the, how the um, uh, vaccines protect us? Mm -hmm. And so the, the Epilogue is about that activity, and we made three vi three videos. They are on the Stardust Mystery YouTube channel. 
there's one visit, one video about how grandpa got infected. The second video is how the vaccines work. And the third video is, is devoted to the, our body's factories that is the center of the infection and the immunity. Um, that's, that's really helpful because if we go, you know, we talked about re- re- at the beginning of our interview of how horrible this has been and, and, and how we're all really done with, you know, being locked up and isolated and wearing masks and, and whatnot. Uh, but if we come through this and we don't learn anything from it, then it's, it's a real waste. But if we can somehow find a way to not only become more empathetic for others who, you know, went, went through this pandemic not as comfortably as maybe you and I went through it. Uh, and we can also learn some science so that we can innovate and make our lives better going forward. Well, then maybe the two years, it was worth it. Wow. You know, I think uh, this certainly is something that, that lots of kids can learn from. I think it's something that really would have helped early on when, when the vaccines are being distributed, letting a lot of adults see it and having them relax and think, okay, yeah. I can take this. Yeah. And, and I think it would have been a better approach than, than the government saying, you have to take it. <laughs> Just get in line, shut up and get in line, do what we say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, tr- I try to make it. we got a couple of thousand views of the, uh, the videos, but certainly not enough. Yeah. Well, the videos out there, this is great information and, and, and a great way for us to understand because I'm, I'm right now listening to a, a, a fascinating book called Life Force, and it is telling us all about the, 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 the way that genetic engineering and stem cells and AI are, you know, coming up with innovations that can really help um, improve our lives and extend our lives and extend our healthy lives. And uh, so there's a lot of, a lot of stuff in it. It's um, it'd be a real blessing for kids, even kids who aren't going to become scientists. They should have this information so, because it can make their lives better. Absolutely. Genetic engineering is going to be the forefront of medicine. They're working on vaccines for cancer treatment. Uh, it is incredibly important. But besides understanding something of the science of genetic engineering and genes and DNA, they're going to have to understand some of the politics associated with this thing. There are some dark sides. Um, the book, The Code Breaker, described a biohacker. Uh, it turns out that what uh, Doudna and Charpentier did was make genetic engineering, cutting and pasting, so easy it could be used by hobbyists. And he, this biohacker, put out on the Internet a uh, a whole genetic engineering toolkit for hobbyists to, to bioengineer the, the muscles in the frog way. So they could make their frogs jump better in the job in the jumping contest. Well, I mean, you can imagine all of the potential difficulties that this could create. Very important, and this is a, this is a good place to stop because I think there's there is a lot, and and you just point out that this information, this knowledge isn't just for scientists. We all need to be aware of this. It, it affects all of our lives. Yeah. If, if, if the pandemic hasn't shown us that science affects all of our lives, then we were asleep for two years. Um, yeah. And so we, we, we really need to share this with our kids. I think The Race to the Big Bang is, it, it sounds like a thrilling book and, and certainly a thrilling book for families to, to co-read and talk about, think about all those discussions that you can have, um, years worth of conversations that can be inspired by, by this book. Um, yeah. 
Dr. Peter, please remind everybody again where they can go to um, not only learn more about the book and you, but also access all those videos and resources you, you were talking about. Okay, so the um, the YouTube channel is called Stardust Mystery. So if you go to YouTube, put in Stardust Mystery, you'll get to our channel. It's got about 40 videos, all kinds of science videos, um, and including in, included in those videos are the, the three that are uh, the, the lessons from the pandemic. Um, the other uh, place to go is our website. It is called thestardustmystery.com. No spaces or anything between the words. Thestardustmystery.com. And there on the educator page, uh, there are um, a whole bunch of uh, there are like four different categories that uh, people can go to to um, uh, see a whole bunch of short stories and the associated videos. One of the four is on the coronavirus. Uh, there are other uh, uh, lessons on atoms, on planet Earth and on the universe. Uh, so each of those lessons has short stories and videos that go with it. Uh, one of the things teachers can do, um, it would really be kind of fun. The, uh, the short stories are told by the seven characters so they can assign the class. Uh, each class can take a character. It's called a, it's called a jigsaw teaching method. Each character, each, each um, teacher can assign kids to be the characters, the same character can get together and compare notes on what they've learned, and then all the characters get together and put the whole story together on the coronavirus or atoms or planet Earth or the universe. Wonderful. Wonderful. We've had a fascinating time speaking with the author of The, of the Race to the Big Bang, Dr. Peter Solomon. Dr. Peter, thank you so much for being back with us today. Jed, you're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Before we invite our next guest into the studio, we want to invite you to connect with us on social media, facebook.com slash reading with your kids, at reading with your kids on Instagram, and at Jedly Magic on Twitter. Join us right now from one of my favorite parts of the country, Northern Virginia. Our guest today is here to celebrate uh, what she hopes will become a beautiful series of books called The Rhyme Time Twins. Please welcome to the show, Etain Raphael. Hey, Etain, how are you? Hi, I'm so good. Thanks for having me. I'm delighted to have you on. Tell us about The Rhyme Time Twins, please. Well, The Rhyme Time Twins is actually my second children's picture book, but it's the first in this series. Um, and it is about self-love. Uh, accepting yourself, you know, for all your differences, trying to find the special things about those differences, um, and particularly embracing the power of words, um, words and actions, really. But in this book, it's particularly about words, um, which is kind of a twist because they speak in rhyme, so their words are already special, but they also have a power, um, a gift, I should say, of storytelling, um, and through those stories, they can overcome a lot of their challenges. Interesting. Now, I'm just curious. You mentioned that the girls, the twins, speak in rhyme. Um, yeah. Is the entire book in rhyme, or is there a narration that's kind of prose, and then they get into their rhyme? Right. I have a great editor named Brooke Vitale, who my first edition, you know, it was all in rhyme. And she just had this great idea, which I wasn't so sure of at the time where she said, you know, I think their words would be set apart even more if they were the only ones and their mom to speak in rhyme and then everything else was in prose. And that would just really um, set it apart. And I just, I, I remember just going to bed that night, like, oh my gosh, I have so much rewriting to do, first of all. And I had put so much thought into making everything rhyme and the meter and all of that. And in the morning, I remember thinking, she's right. I think she's right. And I just said, I'm going to try to rewrite it and see which version is better. And when I read the new version, I just thought, that's really cool. And I don't know any books 
right now that do that. So <laughs> there might be a reason for that. We'll see. I don't know. But I thought it was a special take on it. Well, that was something that, as, as you were speaking, it occurred to me is it would be very, very different, very distinct, that if the narration was in prose and the only people who were speaking in rhyme were the girls, that would, like, really just kind of stand out. And I'm imagining, you know, my daughter, when she was four or five years old, she would have picked up on that probably four or five pages in and just mm. turned to me and said, they're always rhyming. What's up with that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I, I, I say it in the beginning that that's uh, one of the reasons, that's the reason in this book that they're teased. Um, they're teased for the way that they speak and particularly for speaking in rhyme. What was the inspiration for the twins? Uh, the inspiration? So I have two girls who are 21 months apart, so they're not twins. Um, they're Irish but, twins. Yeah, they're Irish <laughs> twins. There you go. Um, and it was funny because I was talking with an author coach named Vicki Weber who um, was helping me figure out how to publish on Amazon and walking me through those steps. And um, she's like... I hadn't come up, I hadn't even thought of it as a series. I was just thinking of it as a book at that point. And she goes, you know, I just had rhyme time twins just pop into my head. And I'm like, oh, well, that's interesting. And again, it's one of those things I kind of put on the back burner in my mind for a bit. And again, you know, after mulling it over for a couple of days, I'm like, I, that's really kind of catchy. I like it. And uh, folks who listen to the show might remember uh, Vicki Weber has been on the program a couple of times. Mm -hmm. She's a great guest, a great author. She's also become a great coach, too. Yes. Yes. She's amazing. And she has, you know, started a Facebook group that is so supportive. Anytime any of us have questions, she hops right on and you can get an answer same day. And it's, it's awesome. I don't think I could have done any of this without the Facebook community, to be honest. Well, you know, one of the things that I've uh, noted is and it's probably the reason that that this podcast has has grown so much and is still being published after four years and thirteen hundred different episodes, is that the the kidlet community, the community of children's authors, is incredibly supportive of one another. Where, I mean, you're all competitors on one level, but there's. It, it, the community acts more like a community, like a collective, as opposed to a series of, of individual competitors, you know, competing yes. for, for a set of eyes. Yes, yes, indeed. And, you know, there's another group called the Cover Critique Group. You know, I don't know if you know Clay Anderson and Katie Weaver. They're incredible, absolutely incredible. And they are just kind of freely giving of their knowledge because they they love children's picture books and they love helping our community and I just think that's such a selfless cool thing that gives all of us the confidence and the courage to just go for it and try and see what we can do you know yeah, yeah. now you were sharing with me earlier you didn't start life off as a children's author I don't even know if you dreamt of being a children's author you came uh you had been a physical therapist yes I had I was a physical therapist um until about probably about four years ago. Um, I'm 47 now, so put that in perspective. But And I loved physical therapy. You know, the, the pinnacle of my career was working at Walter Reed um, National Military Medical Center in Maryland now, um, working in the amputee section there with a lot of the men and women coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan who had sustained traumatic amputations and learning, helping them learn how to, you know, walk on their prosthetic legs and just try to resume a normal life again. And I loved it. It was such an incredible honor to work there. And I met some of the best people I'll ever know, I'm sure. But I was exhausted when I would get home. And around that time, I was having my babies. And I just thought, um, as we got more and more into uh, bedtime and reading, I was just loving it so much. And um, seeing some of what they're doing in art, which I had never been drawn to before, and just slowly kind of chipping away at this idea that wasn't even an idea at the time, but just it slowly just materialized in my brain to just try to illustrate a poem that I had written for them. And then, you know, I just kind of stumbled into these Facebook communities and just thought, should I try this? Like, this sounds kind of fun. 
And, you know, what if, you know, we know what happens. My motto is always, you know what happens if you don't try something, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing happens. But what, you know, it's in my head for a reason. I've never felt this way about anything. So why not just try and just see what happens? That's, that's wonderful. And you're right. You, we always do know what's going to happen if we don't try it. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. You mentioned something earlier that I think is very important for for people who are listening, who are, are aspiring to be children's authors, especially if you're aspiring to write a rhyming children's book. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the word meter, and yes. I think that that is something that, that that a rhyming picture book has to be more than the the last le- the last words of a of a of each sentence rhyme or the mm-hmm. la- you know and there there has to be a meter can you talk a little bit about what I'm not able to articulate clearly right now yes I learned so much through this you know in my in my first book I remember the girls and I we would go over the lines in the poem and we would clap out the syllables and make sure all the syllables um, were even on each line. And then around that time, I started getting into these Facebook groups, and probably it was Brooke at that time, my editor, who who mentioned to somebody, it's not just about syllables, it's about meter, it's about stressed and unstressed syllables, and it has to be absolutely perfect, it has to be precise, because I remember sending a friend one of my first manuscripts for the next book, and she said, I, I hear it when I hear it in your voice. But if I'm trying to read it on my own, I'm not sure how to fall into the right meter. And that was really eye-opening for me because I'm like, well, it's every third syllable. That's that's stressed. And then Brooke was saying, well, you want to, if you're, I was doing every third syllable stressed. And she said, yes, but on the first, uh, at the start of every line, you need to have the stress by the second syllable. So the first or second syllable, and then the readers have to get into that rhythm in order for everything to flow properly in the way you mean it. You know, if, if they don't know how you're reading it, they're going to read it their own way, and it will oftentimes fall flat if it's not meticulous. So whether it's stress on stress or unstress on stress, stress, whatever you're going to do, make sure it's specific and make sure you get that first stress by the first or second syllable of every line. I'm can, like, oh my gosh, rewrite again. <laughs> can, you, can you give us an example of that? Oh, let's see. I'll tell you that I write in something called anapestic tetrameter. Um, so. Is it curable? <laughs> that's it, right? <laughs> let's hope so. Um, kids mocked us and teased us, mom, just like we feared. They laughed when we spoke and they called our rhymes weird. So you can hear kids is the stress syllable. <clears throat> um, kids mock us and tease us, mom, just like we fear. So it's like, dun, 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 And you end on a stress as well. You don't end on an unstress. Um, oh, sorry. It's, it's mocked us, the stress. So kids mocked us and teased us, mom, just like we feared. So you're just constantly doing that in your head and making sure that it, that it falls onto the right syllables, but also you don't want the stress to fall onto words like and or or, unless those are actually meant to be stressed. You want it to be on the words that would also kind of naturally be stressed when you're talking. And I'm really happy that you share this because I don't think a lot of, of people outside of the community, and I don't even think a lot of, I think there are a lot of authors who are at the beginning of their journey who don't understand just how much goes into writing a good children's book. Yes, anybody can write a book that is targeted at kids. Right. But it might not be good. Right. It might not hold the kids' attention. It's not gonna it's not gonna be that book that the kids are gonna want their parents to read four, five, six thousand times. And that's exactly. what you want. You know, one of the things that people are gonna want to know is where they can go to find out more about the Rhyme Time twins and more about Etain Raphael. All right. Um, Etain Raphael is not very tech savvy yet. <laughs> I am on Amazon and I have an author page on Amazon. Um, you could um, just put in words take flight and, um, and find me on Amazon that way. I'm in the process of trying to set up a website and um, figuring out all that goes into that. But for now, Amazon is the best bet. And Facebook on uh, Etain Raphael. Awesome. 
We've had a really great time speaking to the author and illustrator of the Rhyme Time Twins, Etain Raphael. Hey, Etain, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. This was so fun. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast with two great guests. Noria Kamahart will be here celebrating Hola Amiga. And Kirsten and Anika Jensen will be here to celebrate other realities, a thousand feelings. Hey, I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Chris, we're going to start by thanking our guests, Dr. Peter Solomon and Etain Raphael. Also, I want to thank our sponsor, The Adventures of Harry and Friends by Sarah Tucker. My crew needs a great big thank you. Rory Grady, Fatima McCann, Skylar Strauss. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.